That is uh, some very ominous organ playing right there, okay? And if you are like, that reminds me of growing up in church when I was a kid. I'm, first of all, I'm very surprised that you're still here, and I'm very grateful that you're still here. Um, We don't have an organ anywhere on stage, but maybe for you, we could do it. Uh, We want to say welcome to all the campuses that are with us. So Springfield, glad that you're here, and Nixa, and Republic, and Dream Center, and online, um, that we, our hope is that uh, this series, Betrayed by Belief, isn't just helpful in an hour on a Sunday morning, but that honestly, <coughs> excuse me, that it becomes something that kind of um, helps you reconstruct a faith that can withstand everything that we just sang about that's founded on Jesus. Betrayed by belief. We've all been betrayed by different beliefs and that keep us now from having a relationship with God or make it harder to have a relationship with God. And uh, if we're honest, it feels like, well, I I used to believe that and maybe that's not the same thing now. I'll tell you about a time when I was seven years old and I was betrayed by belief. This is the first time that I accepted Jesus into my heart. Now, if you're from uh, kind of like Christian circles, you're like, the first time? I thought you only had to do it one time. Well, the stream of evangelicalism that I grew up in, it was like, uh, you need to accept Jesus in your heart all the time, every time, so there's no sin, no sin, no sins. But the first time was, I was seven years old, and we went to a power team, which um, that was an event that was called the Sons of Thunder. These power team people were like huge muscles, okay? They had tank tops on and like super short shorts, I think, so you can just see the muscles on their legs too. And, and they would blow up water bottles. Now, why this was impressive, I don't know. But they would blow up water bottles just with the power of their lungs. Like, like they would explode and everybody would cheer. And then they'd get phone books and they'd, they'd be like, come on, cheer us on. And then they'd rip a phone book, which later I learned. <laughs> I learned that, that if you bake a phone book in the oven, and almost anyone can do it, right? Which, in fact... <laughs> My dad watched first service and he texts me and he goes, is that true? That happened? I'm like, yeah, they weren't really that strong to rip the phone book. I mean, they do that. They'd lay on a bed of nails and they'd put an ice block on their chest and they'd get someone with a sledgehammer and they'd hit the ice block and it'd break and they'd, be, they'd scream and they'd get up and show their back and be like, I'm fine, I'm fine, all this stuff. Okay, it's weird. It's weird. That's a weird Christian event. But it all led up to this moment. They said... If you want to have power like we have, right? I mean, these people, long 80s hair, big muscles. If you want to have power like we have, come to the front at the count of three. And you're going to receive power greater than we have. And I'm like, I'm seven. I'm seven years old. Who doesn't want, like, I'm in my 30s now and I want power like they have, okay? And so I get off my dad's shoulders. I'm like, okay, one, two, three. And I run up to the front. And they're like, okay, you just need to repeat what we're going to say. Okay, you're going to invite Jesus into your heart. And I'm like, I'll invite Jesus into my muscles, my arms, my heart. I just, you tell me to look like this. And, he's, <laughs> and they're like, you know, I say the prayer, Jesus, I invite you into my heart and all this stuff. And I'm seven years old and they go, amen. Everybody's cheering. And I'm like, it's happening. It's happening. And I look down and to this day, nothing has happened to my body. I mean, I've gotten taller and wider, but other than that, like, a betrayed by belief, okay? Now, seven years old, you're like, you've gotten over it. I don't know if I've gotten over it. I'm still telling you this many years later. But we're betrayed by beliefs that are funny. And sometimes we're betrayed by beliefs that are really cruel, really divisive, really harmful, you know? Sometimes there's beliefs that have snuck into Christian tradition and the Christian faith that you're like, oh, that looks nothing like Jesus. I mean, it could be a political agenda. It can be a household agenda. It could be personal preference. But, and you know how this happens. I mean, you know, we're, we're all adults here. But the way that this happens is you get someone that has a cognitive bias or a group of people, and, and they have an idea that they want to move forward or an ideology that they're like, man, we want the world to think and be like we want it to be. And then they will attach that to a chapter and verse of the Bible, and then they leverage it, right? And now it becomes really confusing because for them, they'll say, if you believe the Bible, you will act this way. If you believe the Bible, you'll believe this way. And it makes it really difficult. It makes it really difficult to see the difference between, well, that 
That's what they're saying, and this is actually God. And sometimes, and, and possibly you, if this has happened to you, sometimes it's so interwoven together in your faith tradition that to challenge it is that they say you're not even a Christian at all. And to challenge it means you leave the church entirely and you leave the faith entirely because for good reason, you're like, I thought they were all intertwined together. And, and this is why so many people are participating in this really big, scary word. You ready? Deconstruction. Deconstruction. They're deconstructing their faith. If you've ever felt betrayed by a belief, you have deconstructed. Yeah. Deconstruction is when you pick apart an idea or a system or a tradition or a belief and um, you test it. And you're saying, is this truthful? Is this useful? And is this effective? This is deconstruction. Now, I know you, you might have been like, no, I've seen deconstruction on the TikToks and the social media or whatever. No, no, no. I, just, I want to talk to you about it in the way that it's, it's properly happening in, in the world. And your faith, if your faith isn't growing with you, because typically people deconstruct faith the older they get, if your faith's not going, growing with you, you will deconstruct. And you'll do it intentionally or you'll do it eventually. You will initiate it because of your questions or life will initiate it for you. But it will happen. Deconstruction, by the way, is, I think, a really intriguing word. I do. And the reason I think so is it, it has this idea of getting to the foundation. Deconstruction is like, I want to get to the foundation of the thing. In fact, I put it in your notes like this. The reason we deconstruct beliefs and traditions is to get to the foundation of our faith. Now, it, it resembles some other words. Deconstruction resembles the word destruction, but it's different. It's not the same word. Deconstruction resembles the word deconversion, but it's different. It's not the same word. Deconstruction is when I'm saying I need to know if the foundation of my faith can hold up my life. And we're just saying about Jesus a firm foundation. And I, I would ask you to consider what if, what if the most firm foundation that can withstand all of life, truly, is that Jesus is God. And then like a period at the end. Not tradition, not religion, not church, like, what if Jesus is God? Well, well, then it changes things, doesn't it? Then it means man, my, all of my life revolves around this relationship I have with God through Jesus. Let me illustrate it this way. Now, I am more nervous to do this Jenga illustration than I am to talk to you about deconstruction. So, hold on. Don't cheer yet, please, because you'll knock it over. Oh my goodness, and now you can cheer. We did it together, okay. That's not, that's like, if I accomplished that today, I did, I did very little. Okay, this is, this is like our faith. That in the deconstructing of our faith, we tend to find things that were like, like I know the rules of Jenga say you can only use one hand, but I'm making the rules right now because I, I drank a lot of coffee and one hand is not gonna work. Like this one. Oh, experience. Has, has an experience ever made you start to deconstruct or question your faith? And we say around here, maybe the reason you don't go to church is because you've been to a church. A lot of people have had experiences that they go, that doesn't line up with Jesus. Um, let's try to find an easier one. Oh, man, we did it. Okay. Oh, uh, dogma, like doctrine. Yeah, that's a big one that you're like, hey, I have some questions. I have some questions about like how to reconcile things. I've read the Old Testament and uh, it's brought up more questions than answers. Dogma is a big reason that people started and continue to deconstruct, which by the way, right now it's about eight and 10 people are doing this. So if you're not doing this, I know you're attached to someone who is doing this and, and they're they're hopefully being thoughtful about it. What about this one? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Does that not cause people to go, wait a second, that doesn't line up with Jesus. Hypocrisy causes you to start picking things apart a little bit. What about, oh, come on. 
It had to be in the middle, didn't it? Yep, yep, yep. Oh, it's a big word, but there's a lot of baggage to this. Bureaucracy. That for some people, they're like, ah, I was really engaged in the institutional church and then the bureaucracy of it ah, made it hard for me to live out my calling and they start deconstructing. They start deconstructing. The, this whole idea, we are always actually probably participating in deconstruction. The, the phrase, you've heard this phrase, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? That phrase comes from the 1500s. It's, it comes from Germany. And that phrase actually was a, a word of caution to people. And kind of the, the reason it came up was like this. The reason they wrote that is it meant in your zeal to separate what is harmful and hurtful from what is helpful, don't throw away what is helpful, okay? That sometimes in our zeal to say that was harmful and cruel and we get rid of that, we end up getting rid of what's helpful in the process. And what I'm trying to say is you, you probably, or the person that you know is probably deconstructing their faith, asking a lot of questions, and, and they're doing so in a way that they probably have good reason to, but um, don't throw baby Jesus out with the bathwater. So you might have been doing this too. I mean, I've heard stories and, and the book that I just had coming out called Deconstruct Faith, Discover Jesus, I interviewed a lot of people and stories like this. Stories of people saying, hey, my son or daughter don't go to church. Okay, why don't they go to church anymore? They don't go to church because they were in youth group and they started asking questions. And they asked questions about things that they weren't supposed to ask questions about. They even answered them in ways that they weren't supposed to answer them. And so, oh, they were told they weren't a Christian. Like, they were told, oh, you interpret Genesis 1 differently? Oh, no, you're not a Christian. And so they left the church. Or, or a story that's familiar for, unfortunately, for a lot of um, traditions is like, hey, if you, like my mom doesn't go to church. Not my mom, but these are just stories. My mom doesn't go to church. Why doesn't your mom go to church? Well, she doesn't go to church because um, she was in an abusive relationship. And when she brought it to the priest or the pastor, they said, well, just submit. It's what the Bible says. Now, listen, we do not believe that here, okay? <laughs> but I'm just here to tell you there are good reasons people are picking apart their faith. And if you are deconstructing your faith, or if you know someone who's deconstructing their faith, um, good for you. That's mature of you. That's honest of you. I hope you don't throw baby Jesus out with all this, but that's honest of you. And you've learned something that a lot of us actually um, are trying to figure out, and it's this. Questions Questions don't ruin your faith. They only reveal the foundation. A bad foundation will ruin your faith. And you're learning that. You're learning that. So we're gonna see that Jesus, it, what are his thoughts on all this? Well, Jesus leads the way. In fact, Jesus leads his disciples to do this while they follow him because all of founda foundation always equals authority, okay? So whenever we're talking about an issue of foundation, what's the foundation of your life? What we're ultimately asking is what's the ultimate authority in your life? And for some people, it's them. Now, I've, I've lived part of my life where the ultimate authority was myself, and I'm not a good foundation, okay? I am like, I can be emotional. I can be, uh, I can change my mind quick. I'm not a good foundation. But... What's the authority in your life? And Jesus, when he walked this earth, he would say things like this. You have heard it said, but I say unto you. And what he was doing is this. You've heard it said, this, this set it aside, but I say unto you. And, and it's like Jesus is saying, I'm the authority here. In fact, a lot of people would argue this is what got him killed, is that Jesus was equating himself to God. And what if he is God? What if Jesus is God? What if the clearest picture we have of God ever in history is the face of Jesus Christ? Then to build our life on that is to build our life on God. And that for sure would hold up, wouldn't it? So Jesus has this way of holding ground for people that were um, violated by the religious leaders. I put it in your notes like this. 
Those who were violated and silenced by the religious leaders were validated and sacred to Jesus. He just has a way of doing this. I mean, here's some examples. There was a woman who was caught in the act of adultery and she was drug out in front of Jesus by religious leaders and Jesus says, whoa, whoa, whoa. If you don't have sin in your life, you can continue the condemnation here. As, and I'm paraphrasing. Well, everyone has sin in their life. And he restores dignity to her. There's other times where Jesus is actually called by the religious leaders. Religious leaders, okay? The people who are supposed to help people see God. Jesus is actually called a glutton and a drunkard by the religious leaders because he hung out with people they didn't want to hang out with. And over and over again, I mean, we see Jesus even saying things like this. Hey, the Pharisees and the, or to the Pharisees, he said the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. I mean, you want to talk about deconstructing a tradition or a belief system. He's constantly doing this. Why? Because he's setting himself up in the 33 years he lived on earth, he's setting himself up as the authority, saying, I am God. If he even says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's setting himself up that he's the reliable foundation, not tradition. In fact, there's a lot of things we pick up even in the church, and the church is not a reliable foundation. What do we build our life on? What if it's Jesus? Because then we're building our life on God. So uh, there's four biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I want to read a passage from the book of Mark, okay? Mark chapter 7, and you're going to see Jesus doing this. And then we're going to talk about how we can engage in this in our lives and with the people that we love. So Mark chapter 7, verse 1 says, Now, when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. So let me just pause. If you're a parent here and your kids are like my kids that before we eat, we're like, please wash your hands, you can tell them biblically, your hands are defiled, okay, if you want to. I don't know if you want to. Then it says, verse 3, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and cupper vessels and dining couches. Okay, all that to say this. It is biblical to wash your hands and do dishes. I did tell, I did tell our kid point director, I'm like, hey, if you could teach the kids Mark chapter 7, verse 3 and 4, clear application. And she laughed. Okay, but verse 5. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Now, this has nothing to do with really germs, okay? This isn't like, hey, wash your hands so that you don't have germs. The, the idea of germs was really underdeveloped at this point. I mean, there's, it's just not there. This had to do with wash your hands because what you do on the outside, you are on the inside. So it's like, hey, wash your hands is like I cleanse my hand of worldliness. And then when I intake food, I'm not intaking worldliness. I mean, this is the way that they thought back then. And this is a tradition that they taught. So then Jesus goes ahead and he quotes a prophet that they believe in named Isaiah. And he says, well, aren't you the hypocrites that Isaiah was speaking of? Wow. And I can just imagine watching this and being like, well, this is, this is causing a little bit of a deconstruction here, okay? Um, aren't you the hypocrites? And he quotes Isaiah about giving superficial lip service to God, and then he kind of ends it like this. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. He said, and then he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your own tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, so this is the traditions they're adding, but you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbett, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition and you, that you have handed down, and many such things you do. And many such things. Here's what he's saying. Hey, um, there's a thing that God said about honoring your father and mother. And then you all built a lot of things around that. 
on top of that. One of them was this idea of declaring Corbin, which means if you have something that you like that's a value, okay, you have an item or a possession or a property, and your parents are in need, you just declare that word, and now that's God's. Who are you to sell it? Right? How convenient that you can just now use it for the rest of your life. And you don't have to give to the poor. I mean, this was a big deal. Jesus is constantly setting himself up as the authority. But in order to do that, sometimes, many times, he has to pick apart traditions. And so do we. Because we've been betrayed by beliefs. Some beliefs, not all. This picture you're probably familiar with, this is uh, Mount Rushmore, okay? If you've never seen it before, now you've seen it on a big screen, okay? But, but it's, it's a fascinating thing to go see. Before it was Mount Rushmore, here's what it looked like. In the Black Hills of South Dakota, that's the mountain. Now, in the early 1900s, they started, like these mountains started getting attention. It was about in 1921 when these mountains the project started to build Mount Rushmore. And here's what happened. The person who oversaw this project realized America was in some struggles when it came to like the economic times and culturally. And so that person wanted to pick the four faces that they believed got America through difficult times in the past. Now, whether you agree with this person's way of thinking or not is aside from the issue, this is just the history of Mount Rushmore. So they said, um, we want to pick the four faces and so in 1921 to 1947, they started blowing up this mountain. And by blowing up, I mean like dynamite. When we went and saw it many years ago, my wife and I asked them and they said, yeah, yeah, this was done, over 90% of what you see in the mountain was done through dynamite. You know that song, TNT, dynamite. I don't, I don't know, it's not a Christian song. But it's just saying, that, that's like, that's the theme song of Mount Rushmore, okay? Uh, they, they blew it up. And then the rest of it was done. They would be hanging from the side of the mountain for about $8 a day, chiseling away. Were they strapped in? Probably not. And uh, that's where you see Mount Rushmore. Th this idea that you can have a huge, unmovable mountain that's an obstruction to people's path and turn it into a symbol of hope to people by blowing it up that's crazy. Um, that's, that's what's happening culturally with deconstruction. Is people are like, hey, I don't know about religion or whatever your umbrella term would be for religion, tradition, I don't know. And then what we're saying is like, but what if we could see the face of Jesus? What if we could do something in church and in tradition and to our traditions and to our church, that's, that's the face of Jesus. And then people can choose, what do you want to do with Jesus? But that because, this is what, uh, this is what the Bible says. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says this, remember our message is not about ourselves. We are proclaiming Jesus Christ, the master. Meaning it's not about our tradition, it's not about our faith, we're proclaiming Jesus. We are his, uh, all we are is messengers, errand runners from Jesus for you. It all started when God said, light up the darkness and our lives filled up with light as we saw and understood God in the face of Christ. Where is the hope that they had? Well, as we saw and understood God in the face of Christ, all bright and beautiful. And I, I like to read that and imagine explosion, explosion, explosion. Ah, oh, the face of Jesus when all I thought there was were these beliefs I was betrayed by. The mountain of religion isn't meant to be climbed and conquered by a few. It's meant to be transformed into something that more closely resembles Jesus. So what I want to do with our remaining time is to talk about how do we do this? How, how do we um, blow something up so that in the end we have a clearer big picture of Jesus? How do we deconstruct so that in the end, we have a sure foundation that is Jesus. Why? Because it's worth considering. If Jesus is the clearest picture we have of God, then to build on anything less than him is just not gonna hold, okay? 
So in your notes, I have this acronym for FUSE, for like lighting the fuse, right? That if we were all like, okay, we're going to turn this mountain of religion into, it just sounds like we're, you know, we're all got sticks of dynamite. How do we light the fuse? And, and here's what I'd say, if you are in the middle of this process, I told you earlier, good for you, honest of you. I would also say, um, Jesus wants to lead the way with you. I think he has. If you're walking with someone who's in this process, this will be really helpful for you to kind of give some handles to how you do this. So the F in FUSE stands for find the specific. Find the specific. What's the specific thing that, that you find that you're deconstructing? Now, people say a lot, I'm just deconstructing all of Christianity. Nobody can deconstruct all of Christianity. I, I mean, they're, they're, it's just so vast and wide and deep. But find the specific. Like what Jesus didn't say in this text was he didn't look at the Pharisees and the religious leaders and say, out with everything you believe. <laughs> Throw it all out. Get rid of all your tradition. He didn't say that. He said, hey, when it comes to this, like washing your hands and the dishes and all stuff in the superficial way they thought of that, that's not a deal breaker. Like this other one that you made, this other tradition. What's the specific thing, the the question you have and get as specific as possible because you have like a whole life ahead of you that you might be doing this for the rest of your life. And this makes sure that you're like, I'm going to get to the foundation on this issue. Um, who, who in here drinks coffee? Raise your hand. All, all campuses, just raise your hand if you drink coffee. Okay. If you don't have your hand raised, it just means you have one less addiction than the rest of us. So congratulations. Now here's the real coffee drinkers. Raise your hand if you drink stuff other than Starbucks. I'm just kidding. I, I, I say that, but I have Starbucks because it's convenient. But yes, okay, we, if you like coffee, you'll be able to follow this. Um, raise your hand if you drink wine. No, I won't say that in church. But, uh, but whether you're talking to someone who's a coffee drinker or a sommelier, they, they drink wine for a living, um, what they'll tell you is they have what's called like a tasting wheel. A tasting wheel. And the tasting wheel has these big categories on the wheel, and then they get more and more specific. So when you talk to someone who is, if you're tasting coffee with someone, they want, there's like a, something you're not allowed to say. You're not allowed to say, ooh, this tastes smooth, because smooth's not a description, or it's not a taste. Smooth is just, it just means I can swallow this. I don't know, right? It just... So they'll ask you, like, what does it taste like? Maybe you're like, oh, it tastes a little fruity. And they'll be like, okay, what kind of fruit? Apricot, fig, blueberry, minced pie. Is minced pie fruit? I don't know. Minced pie, right. Is it, it, they'll, they'll get more and more specific. They're trying to refine your palate. And when I did these interviews with people that have um, deconverted and people who are deconstruction and people who have never asked questions, and um, I created a deconstruction wheel that takes these big categories and just to say, get as specific as possible. If it's doctrine, what doctrine? Are we talking about the doctrine of hell? Are we talking about like the free will, why there's evil and suffering in the world? Hypocrisy, okay, are we talking personal hypocrisy? Are we talking what we've seen in the headlines we've read? Get as specific as possible because it's gonna help you get to the foundation. And at North Point, we're, we're trying to help with this. I mean, we have on your seats, you have this, uh, this card says master class. You don't have to be a master to go to this class. But we are going to bring masters in to teach this class. Throughout the summer, we're going to have, at the end of every month, a master class on a really specific topic. And it's going to take place at the Springfield and the Nixa location, okay? It'll be live at one and simulcasted to the other. And the first one is New Testament culture and politics that we're bringing in an Israeli historian to be able to talk to us for about an hour and present what was it like to see the world through the eyes of Jesus, through the culture and the politics of Jesus? And, and you better believe you'll probably do this that night. Oh my goodness, I didn't know. But we're getting closer to our Jesus foundation. And you'll have community and there'll probably be food and all, all these things. So yes, shameless plug, register for a master class. I think it's gonna be great. But it's gonna help you get specific. It's gonna help you get specific. Here's the you in the fuse method. Understand where it came from. 
where did this tradition or this belief or this practice come from? And Jesus says, and here he's like, hey, remember this one? That came from you guys um, misinterpreting this honor your father and mother. Not just misinterpreting it, twisting it. Not just twisting it, infusing it with your own selfish agenda. Where did it come from? Sometimes we minor on the majors and we major on the minors. I mean, we hold our preferences really tight. And, and it's impossible to get rid of preferences fully. But when we're on this journey with Jesus, we are always going to encounter people that think different than us. And if we hold tightly the things that don't matter, then we won't hold tightly the person in front of us. This won't happen. We have to understand where does this tradition or this belief or this idea, where does it come from? Is it because my mom and dad taught, me, taught this to me? Is it because of my denomination? Is it because of my network of churches? Is it because it's the way that I want things to be? Or is it because the authority of Jesus has come in and set this precedent for us all? Those are two totally different things. Let me tell you about lobsters. I mean, that, I don't have a good transition from that to lobsters, okay? But let me tell you about lobsters. Lobsters didn't always used to be this delicacy. Like, after church, if you, I mean, I would imagine in Springfield, Missouri, red lobster is going to be packed. We would all prefer Chick-fil-A, it's Christian chicken, and then they're closed on Sundays. And so then we're like, okay, let's, let's go to Red Lobster. If you go to Red Lobster, you're going to see plenty of people ordering lobster. you see the tank. Lobsters didn't used to be a delicacy. Um, lobsters actually used to be the cockroaches of the sea. They still kind of are if you think of them like that. I, I am going to ruin lobster for you, okay? Just so if you're watching online, you can change the channel. But stay seated. Lobsters, there was in so, such abundance on the East Coast that they would just pile up and then um, they would be given to prisoners. Like just... Eat the lobsters. That We have too much of it. There's abundance of them and they're gross. They're bottom feeders. Lobsters. It's like the garbage of the sea. Well, then what happened is the railroad tracks would go from, one, from the east coast to the west coast. And in going through, they needed something that was cheap, some food that was cheap that didn't feel cheap because the people who could make the trip from the east coast to the west coast, those people had money. So they're like, okay, we really need these people to think that they're eating well. And uh, let's preserve some lobster and feed them lobster, maybe when they're going through the Midwest. So they did. And the lobster was this delicacy on the plate and they dressed it up and it looked nice and a, a little thing of butter next to it. And then it became really expensive. We took junk and garbage and made it a delicacy. And we tricked us all, okay? I mean, technically, I think that Pop-Tarts should be more expensive than lobster, that's my personal opinion. This is what we've done in so many areas of Christian tradition is we didn't mean to sometimes, <laughs> but got in the garbage, the things that didn't matter. And we're like, this is the main dish. That's the main dish. Now I'll tell you the main dish is <laughs> Jesus. It's his love for you. It's the Jesus story that he's still alive and he still wants something to do with your life. And he's still redeeming the world. That's the main dish. The other stuff that may be standing in the way, um, some of it's garbage. But we must understand where it came from. Where did it come from? That's the U. The S in the fuse method is share the impact. If you're walking with, this, uh, walking with someone through this, um, if you personally are saying, Okay, I'm going through deconstruction. I'm going through doubts and questions in my own life. Um, my prayer is that North Point, and I believe this, is a safe place for you to find and follow Jesus. And don't do this by yourself. Don't do this by yourself. It's really dangerous. Because then you get really confused and it's hard to separate the things. Find trusted people. But in the same way, if you know someone who's doing this, don't let them do it by themselves. I mean, you can't like force yourself to be their friends, but be the kind of person they want to be friends with. Share the impact with them. That, hey, as I've learned this, here's the impact it's had on me. Maybe you don't change your mind on the issue, but you might change your posture, right? Here's the impact it's had on me. Or if you're the one deconstructing, to be able to tell someone, hey, 
this has had a really big impact on me as I've been on this journey. What you're gonna see is a video of some of our best friends. Um, well, it's Kristen is on the video. Her and her husband, Kristen and Nathan, are some of my wife Lisa and I's best friends. They live across the street from us. And since we've lived in Springfield, we've just become better and better friends. And, and she's gonna share the impact that this journey has had on her. And then we'll get into what the E is and how we find this foundation of Jesus. Watch this video. I grew up in a very um, conservative Southern Baptist church um, pretty much my whole life and um, just always sort of felt like the way I saw people act in private or at home was different than the way they acted at church. Um, being judgy or um, hypocritical. Even as a child, I felt like, I don't think they're doing it right. I don't think this is the way that God intended us to love other people. So I was pretty much in church my whole, um, all the way up till I went to college and even in college, I would go a little bit and then um, a little bit into adulthood. And then I just, just got so turned off by it. So, you know, out of college, I just never quite found the environment that I was looking for, which is love others, don't judge other people. Like your job as a Christian is to love other people. That's it, it's so simple. So it was just this overall feeling, kind of a cumulative feeling over my youth of seeing people be holier than thou at church, um, being the good servant Christian and then going home and talking about other people at church or, um, you know, just having that sort of judgmental um, attitude. And so I, you know, even as a child, I just knew that that didn't really feel right to me and I didn't want anything to do with it. So there wasn't really one specific instance. It was just sort of this like over and over and over again. I saw that as an example of Christianity that I wanted nothing to do with. So my neighbor, Preston Ulmer, <laughs> Um, I think we've talked about this in our driveways. We're next door driveway neighbors, and we've talked about this for at least a year of me just asking him, okay, tell me about North Point. I want to know, like, what's it really like? What are the people really like? Because I don't want any of that fake Christianity. I want nothing to do with it. And so the first time we went to North Point, we rolled up. You know, there's like music going and there's bubbles um, and the little, you know, like the windsock guys are going and it just seemed really fun. But what caught my eye, I'm walking in and on the side of the building, huge, says a safe place to find and follow Jesus. And I'm like, yes, it's not hard. That's, it was just, it spoke to me and I immediately felt a connection to that message that everyone's welcome here. And that's super important to me. And so, um, you know, the first service actually Preston was preaching so that it was a good first time for us to come um, and just kind of feel the lay of the land. But, but every time after that, I've just been blown away by the come as you are environment. Um, I brought my mom with me a couple of weeks ago. She was in town and my dad passed away about a year ago. And so just having her next to me Growing up in a very conservative family and church, I didn't know if she would like it or not. And every single song spoke to grief and um, that God is always there with you, you know, even in the tough times. And so we're just like <laughs> both a mess. And afterwards, she was like, that was awesome. So I feel like if I can love it and she can love it, like anyone can find their place at North Point. I have felt betrayed by the belief that you have to have your life together to be a good Christian, that you, that struggling um, means you're failing. And that is not at all what life is about or what Christianity is about or a relationship with God is about. The struggle is the journey. That's how you learn and how you grow. So I wish I would have known that a long time ago. Maybe I wouldn't have run for so long. Hmm. Amazing. The struggles, the journey. They're like, this is the journey. You see how messy my stand is getting up here? 
And I, I think that's the journey. The struggle is the journey. You're like, oh, but it's like I have so many questions and it's hard to find God and it's, that's why we keep saying, if you see, if you have Jesus as a foundation, you're gonna see God clearly. Without Jesus as a foundation, we won't see God clearly. We won't. So here's the E in the FUSE method. Engage with what remains. Engage with what remains. God remains. I believe that there's a creator behind this universe and that he personally wants to have a relationship with us and that that creator has to be um, the beginning and the end, has to be forever. God remains. Well, if Jesus is God, Jesus will always remain. So who's Jesus? Jesus is God moving into the neighborhood. Jesus is God in the bod, as Jeremy puts it a lot. Jesus is um, God. He's walking among us about 2,000 years ago. And he's teaching people and he's guiding people. And then he does miracles. He's showing the power of God. And, 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 and then he dies for the sins of the world. And, th and that, then he conquers death. And he says, hey, no longer does condemnation and shame have a claim on your life because my death shows you how much I love you. And, and he says, I'm still with you and he's with us through his spirit. Like that, Jesus being among us, putting on flesh, is called the incarnation in theological circles. The incarnation. And here's what I, how I put it in your notes. The incarnation declares that God loves us, isn't scared of us, and wants us to be unafraid of him. Now, I don't know what you've decided to build your life upon or if this is like, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm deconstructing to a foundation. The foundation that I've chosen is this foundation, that Jesus is God and he, it declares that God loves us, he's not scared of us, and he doesn't want us to be scared of him. And that flies in the face of a lot of tradition and a lot of false beliefs that we've been betrayed by. That flies in the face of a lot of religious claims even. But I think like it's the thing I'm most confident about even as far as historically did this happen. That God loves us. And by the way, he's not scared of you. So if you've heard this before, this saying, I want you to let go of it. If you've heard God, God can't be in the presence of sin, you're like, well, then how am I supposed to have a relationship with him? And what was the incarnation if not God walking amongst and being friends with a bunch of sinners, okay? But just so God's not scared of your mess. He's not scared of your questions. You're not. Jesus asked way more questions than he did give answers. And he doesn't want you to be afraid of him. But there are a lot of beliefs that have betrayed us that make us afraid of God. And those beliefs should be deconstructed. And then when we find Jesus, we go, hey, thank you for being the firm foundation on which I can stand. So if this is you, we want to partner with you, walk with you through this. Hopefully this method is helpful for you. But don't give up. Jesus is leading the way. I think Jesus was like the original deconstructionist, okay? Because he had to set himself up as the authority. I think he was. And if you're walking with someone else through this, let us know how we can help. But don't give up on them either because people who are honest, honestly have to let go of things that are getting in the way between them and Jesus. Let me pray for us. Thank you, God, that you are a firm foundation. May we um, always be able to have confidence in that and when we can't have confidence, we just pray that you would be gracious to us as we continue to remind ourselves of that truth. Help us to help one another as we go on this journey because the struggle, the journey, that's what it's all about. And may we always be reminded that you love us, you're not scared of the mess that we've made of our lives, and you want us to be unafraid of you. And if we build on that, God, I believe that that is what will withstand all of life and all of trials and all of our questions. In Jesus' name, amen.